On my shoulder As you lay away And you always loved the smoke by eight Cause baby don't mind It's never colder Than when the daylight breaks Do you now regret the bed we made Does it cross your mind Oh baby Does it cross your mind I did not intend to slow you down Even hope that we would have spoke by now I was acting like an only child What takes forever is a lesson learned I have nothing to show for the medals I Maybe I mind Cause no one's ever Seen me traipsing in I've been hiding from all the places I've been I'm Sore from trying And acting Like an only child I did not intend to slow you down Oh, even though I know we'd have spoke by now Well, maybe we were only lying Heaven's closing They're still pouring drinks And if all those crazy ways you think I love you lying But I can't reason With the past we face I'm sorry for the mess we made If you want, we'll pick through my mistakes You'll see me crying But maybe we could put it all behind I did not in Tend to force your hand Oh, even though we swore we'd understand Well, maybe we'll be always trying We'll be always Trying. Well, how should we proceed with
I'm Jill Riley from The Current, and I am sitting with someone who I feel like we've had a long and storied history with here at The Current, as um, we've been playing the band Mumford & Sons for a long time, such a great audience in the Twin Cities, and this market really, the live music market for sure, embraced this band, and so it's really awesome to have him back on his solo tour. Marcus Mumford is here. How are you? Yeah, I'm very well. It's nice to see you. I um, I was just scrolling through some photos from 2008 when Mumford & Sons played at the 400 bar, which mm-hmm. very small bar. I, I think you barely fit your kick drum on the stage. Um, but it was kind of fun to go back and kind of revisit, you know, the past and then up to where you are now. I mean, it's pretty incredible. And here you are with a solo record. Um, it's called Self-Titled. And when I first saw that, I thought, oh, maybe that's just like a placeholder we made because generally we say Mm self-titled instead of saying a name, Um, but it's not called Marcus Mumford. It's called self-titled. So I wonder um, what was the decision in in really like calling it that instead of your name? I didn't want to see too much of my name. Right. (laughs) But I think the word (sighs) self is really impactful and powerful because this record really is about you. Yeah, but I like the idea that <clears throat> the story, some of the stories on this record can be relatable to other people. So I like the idea that it can be their record too. So you can kind of insert yourself into it. That was ah. my hope for it. Now, when it comes to being you know, relatable, this record certainly has been relatable to a lot of people. Um, I wonder if you could just take me back to where you started in making the record, like when did you decide, you know what, this is the time that I'm going to make a record for me? I had advice from a friend who basically said, just write songs and see what comes out and let that guide you. So really follow the creative. And the first song I wrote was Cannibal and the second song I wrote was Grace. And then I wrote one other and I'd already had Only Child in my back pocket. 
and it just didn't feel like a band record but f and i played it to the band and they agreed and uh but then i didn't really know what it was then so i hadn't yet decided to make a solo record quote unquote i mean it's the most collaborative piece of music i've ever worked on so calling it a solo record feels weird but um and i made that i made the sort of decision that it was a solo record really late because I just wanted to keep writing songs for the sake of writing songs mm -hmm. and not thinking about releasing them or an audience or the live show or anything that I felt could distract because I get easily distracted from my primary job, which is to try and write songs. And I hadn't written any songs for a long time. So I tried to just stay in sort of a state of mind of writing and creating rather than thinking about how I was going to release it, which included for me not thinking about it as a whole record until all the songs were written, which was like, December last year. Okay. So it's quite late. Was this at a time where you had maybe more time to, you know, sit with the idea of, um, of writing a record? I mean, you know, it wasn't long ago that the music industry was, you know, shut down and mm -hmm. as musicians and touring musicians, you know, you probably had a lot of a lot more time on your hands than you Yeah, but I didn't find the pandemic or any of the lockdowns in the UK, which were pretty brutal, mm -hmm. um, I didn't find them at all creatively inspiring. Yeah, you you're know? not the first person to tell me that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for some people, I think it would be a dream to have the world in some ways, right? <laughs> you have to be careful because obviously the circumstances were grim. Mm -hmm. But for some people, like the idea of being forced to stay at home and be able to just create and having no distraction from that is a kind of attractive idea. Mm -hmm. or one that they would make the most of creatively. I didn't find that. You know, I, I found it not at all creatively inspiring. I mean, I was working on doing the music for a TV show while I was at home and I had a studio. So in that sense, I was really lucky that I could work through it um, and stay kind of occupied vaguely. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't really till the end, or towards the end of the lockdowns that I started really leaning into it. And yeah, well, you were busy being a human being. Yeah, and it was <laughs> and the longest period of time. The whole thing, right. Well, yeah, and it was the longest period of time I'd ever been at home since high school because we just went straight out on the road, you know, mm -hmm. um, started touring. I mean, we were here in 08. That's wild. I finished school in 05. So we that were is already, wild. <laughs> you know, touring the UK for a couple of years before coming here. So, yeah, I hadn't been at home for very long at all. Like, so COVID was the longest period of time I'd been at home. And that, for me, provided some structure and some kind of routine that was helpful in my life to try and, like, clear away some of the shambles. So I took the opportunity for that. And from that, I think, came this record. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the first song, um, you know, Cannibal. When you wrote that song, I mean, you know, I mean, just outside of, like, really getting into a studio to record it, I have to assume that you had made a demo or you played it did, for yeah. someone were you scared to let that out i mean it's a song i mean i didn't think about putting yeah. it out for ages okay i didn't even think about who was going to hear it i just wrote it recorded a demo and kind of moved on to the next song really and then just kept going writing more songs and more songs mm -hmm. thinking again it would have been a distraction for me thinking about how to release it or how people were going to listen to it or anything like that i left that till quite late in the process like this spring really to start thinking that through. So no, I just wrote it. Mm -hmm. Wrote another song, wrote another one, and another one. I kept going. I've wrote a lot of songs to this record, actually. Well, Whittled it down in the end. Yeah, and I mean, this is the song that kicks off the record. And, you know, when you put on a record and you hear that first song, it's like, okay, well, how is this going to relate to, like, the arc or the story of an album? And I mean, it's a heavy one. You've talked about it. It's, you're, you're dealing with some pretty serious trauma and it comes out in the song. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what was the reaction when you played it for people, maybe just people in your circle or, you know, trusted friends or, you know, what was the reaction? I, I only ever played it as a one, two. I played it Cannibal and then Grace. Mm -hmm. I never played Cannibal on its own because they're a pair of songs to me and a sort of yin and yang. So um, the reaction was pretty, from some people, was pretty intense. But... That's not really my responsibility, you know. I didn't really, like, focus too much on that, really. I mean, a lot of it led to encouragement to keep writing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, most people I played it to said, like, keep writing. This is good. So that was encouraging. The song Grace. Much better than the alternative. Yeah, right. <laughs> you, should, you should stop now. You should. <laughs> I think we should stop Let's here. call it there. Right. Um, <laughs> 
Now, a song like Grace, and you say that they're really related. They're a pair. Um, what does that word mean to you? Like, how does it come up in your life? Um, it has a few different meanings, so how you carry yourself, mm-hmm. the grace of God, the, you know, like how you treat others. Um, what is that word, like, what does it bring up for you? Uh, I think it brings up the idea of abundance to me mm. and the idea of healing. Uh, so that it's not just getting over the line, struggling over the line, but it's actually like living l- life more to the full on the other side of the line. Mm. And that's what it's felt like to me, you know, freedom and grace. That's what it, I think that's what it means to me. Yeah, freedom is a big word mm. to describe it. Um, I, I think I was looking at the opportunity to begin again. That feels like grace to me. And that's what I wrote the song for. Like the cannibal ends with the idea of beginning again. Mm-hmm. And then grace as a song is about the process of beginning again. And like... And and for all that it can involve, like humor and freedom and joy, uh, all of which I think is embodied in that song, you know. I'm talking with Marcus Mumford here on The Current, the new record, self-titled. Um, now, when it came time to record the record, tell me about uh, who you worked with, mm-hmm. producer, where did you record it? Yeah, so I started at home, my studio at home, and did some demos, and then I sent them to Blake Mills in L.A., who's been a long time friend of mine. And we'd always talked about collaborating more. We toured together. We did an Elton John cover together once of Someone Saved My Life Tonight. And that was my favorite recording experience I'd ever had. And then we wrote this song Only Child together a few years back, which is on the record. And uh, I took the songs to him and, and really just wanted to explore what it would look like working with him and how he would challenge me because we'd been friends for a long time. He wasn't, he was just in that kind of really sweet way that friends can be. He was super honest with me about where he felt I could improve as a writer. And so we went for it. We, we just dived in straight away and went for it. And it was really a mind opening experience for me. And we would invite people through the studio and, Uh, you know, other collaborators, which was really fun. And other musicians he'd worked with that I hadn't, who ended up on the record. We kind of put together a different band for each song, really. Played a lot of the instruments ourselves, and then we'd be like, who would suit this on the kit, you know? And we'd call up Steve Ferroni or Jim Keltner, who played on a bunch of the tunes. He's my favorite drummer of all time. So it was was pretty fun, and it was a long, you know, the sessions lasted for a long time. It was over a year we were recording. Mm-hmm. in fits and starts um but it was yeah it was wonderful i loved that yeah, you mentioned you know when we started talking you said it's almost strange to call this a solo record because you had so many collaborators yeah. like it didn't it didn't feel like it was you know just you there were you know you mentioned some of the musicians and the um you know the guest appearances i mean you've got brandy carlisle she's Mm-hmm. Incredible, mm-hmm. Uh, Phoebe Bridgers and Claro, and uh, I had to look up a name, and then I realized who it was. Um, Monica Martin from yeah. Fox, which yeah. from our neck of the woods That's here right. in the Midwest. Um, and as I was looking down that list, I thought that had to have felt like a bit of a change of pace. I mean, to have mm. like so many women present, mm-hmm. I thought that was kind of cool. How did that, you know, how did that affect you know recording? Uh, massively it sort of it sort of uh, infused the record with a spirit and an energy that it really needed I think uh, I've worked in a male dominated environment for a long time and that's fine but given the opportunity to work again with women because I started my career out working with Laura Marling and mm-hmm. she kind of taught me the ropes really and I was her drummer for a few years and then on record, I hadn't really worked with women since, really, which has had to be fixed. And I really launched myself into it, and it was weird. I didn't realize at the time how necessary, I think, you know, in my moments of vulnerability, the strength of these women around me was, it was really crucial to the making of the record. You know, Brandy, early on, I played her Cannibal and Grace. 
she put her arm around me and said, like, dude, whatever it takes to get this record out of you, I'm here. Wow. Which was really, which was a real turning point for me making the record at all. Because it was obviously a space I wasn't necessarily comfortable in away from the band and wasn't sure about how that was going to go. And to have the encouragement of her, who's, she's become like a sister to me, really. She's more like a soulmate. Oh, weirdly. that's awesome. Yeah, she's yeah. dope. So... And the others as well came along and, you know, Clara was, well, she really led me through the process of writing Dangerous Game. I completely relied on her, which was awesome yeah. and humbling, you know. Yeah, I'm so glad I, that just to have that, I think, I mean, I will say this as a woman, that there is, there is a strength and maybe some nurturing that mm-hmm. I think that, you know, we as women... Um, you know, whether it's natural or taught that, um, that, yeah, that we're, I think we're really able to offer (laughs) in a variety of situations, not just, you know, child rearing, but really as like a friend and someone that can offer support and encourage vulnerability. Yeah. And there was a toughness and a resilience Mm -hmm. that I think the women on this record brought to me, um, and called out of me that I wasn't able to access on my own, Mm -hmm. which was dope. I'm talking with Marcus Mumford here on The Current. Um, Self-titled is the solo record. What has the live show been like? How did you approach that? Because, you know, without having, you know, your your bandmates, Mm. Mumford and Sons, um, did you think, okay, well, I could stand on a stage by myself Mm -hmm. with a piano, guitar, um, or did you think like, well, how do I fill this in? You know, like, how did you want to structure the show? I wanted to, well, we're halfway through this US tour and it being the first tour, the record's only been out a few weeks, really. So I wanted to kind of try and present the record with a full band properly. So I went around and asked some guys to come join me and then asked the right support to make the show feel like a whole show, not just me on a stage. So Danielle Ponder joined us for the first half and the A's are with us on the second half, which is amazing. Amelia and Alex, who are also in Mountain Man and Amelia's in Sylvan S. Oh, right. Sure. Mm-hmm. Okay. Alex grew up here, actually. Okay. So this is a hometown show for her. That's is awesome. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I wanted to play all the songs on the record. It feels like it's a one-off tour. You know, I'm not going to do this lots. This is a sort of period of time in my life where I present this record live which is the only really the only way i know how and i play some band songs on my own and then do some basement tape songs and kind of mess around play a cover or two and then uh and then play the whole record which is what we've been doing and it's been interesting i think some people show up for the show expecting kind of a month and a son's show which is completely natural and it's my job to kind of guide them through how different it is i think most people have been digging it i'm sure some people don't like it <laughs> that's all right <laughs> it's different right. you know so um but it's been really it's been really fulfilling and i wanted to do it in theaters and spaces like the palace here which is just such an amazing place and i haven't been to some of these rooms for a long time so i was really stoked about that and i wanted to get around the whole country i wanted to do the opposite of a vegas residency yeah okay <laughs> it's not time yet <laughs> um so to go to people um which has been really really fun I'm talking with Marcus Mumford here on The Current. The record is self-titled. We've been playing, I think, three of the songs, Cannibal, Grace, Better Off High. Mm -hmm. So it was was cool that you started with maybe a a deeper deeper cut from the album Mm -hmm. as we kind of get to know really kind of the, the, the narrative and get to know more about you as a kind of, as really like a full person. Mm. Um, Again, uh, I, I really hope that um, that you've heard great feedback because it, it really seems like this one's hitting home with a lot of people. Yeah, and I think, you know, I, it's not as commercial a record as a Mumford & Sons record is. And it was just what was in me for this period of time. And I, I found it really fulfilling putting it out. And kind of the theme for me has been no shame. And it's felt pretty shameless. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Good. <laughs> and... Uh, and that's felt cool, you know. And then it's, you know, it's just a, just, just a record in what I hope to be a long series of records that I get to produce in my career. 
Um, so what is the future um, for Mumford and Sons? You're getting in a room playing each other the songs we've written. Yeah? Of which Great. there are a bunch. Yeah. Yeah, Ben came to a show last week. Oh, we, really? Yeah, jumped up. We played together and it was so fun. As soon as he opened his mouth to sing, we sang a couple songs together. It was like, oh, that's why we're in a band together. That's so fun. So, um, so yeah, the next the next step is just finding the time to get in a room together and play some songs, which I think will be the beginning of next year. Okay. And we're pretty stoked about that. Very it's cool to fun. hear. Yeah. I love it. Marcus Mumford mm-hmm. uh, here in the current studio. And my uh, my final question. I have to know, you mentioned his name when we were talking and I was like, I'm going to come back around to that. Uh-huh. Um, when did you first meet Elton John? And did I mention his name? You sure did. Did I? You did. Oh. Well, you talked about doing an Elton John cover. Uh, there so, you go. You're yes, right. Yes. You're right. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, am yeah. paying attention. You are. I am. Um, but seriously, <laughs> like when when did that friendship I first met him at the up? Grammys. Okay. Right. It's one of those really name droppy stories because it's like, I, I love, was at fine, the Fine. That's fine. You were at the Grammys. Elton, you were deserving. And so. <laughs> um, we played together in the Leave on Helm tribute. Okay. Just before the curtain came up and we're about to play on the Grammys live. We'd been rehearsing and stuff and hanging out and he was so sweet. He knew all the stats for our band, like deep knowledge of our band and how we were performing on the radio and stream numbers and all this stuff, which I have no idea about. He's got sort of this sort of strategist mind. It's amazing. Um, and, um, and just before the curtain comes up and we're live on the Grammys in front of however many tens of millions of people, he calls Win over and I'm next to Win. He calls us over. He goes, quick, 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 quick. And this like, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome. And he, as a curtain, he goes, now would be a terrible time to get your dick out. <laughs> <laughs> and then it kicks in. To, and, then, uh, and then we're playing and we're like, start the show, like laughing. It's really funny. Uh, and since then, really, he's <laughs> stayed in touch. He's been really faithful as a friend mm-hmm. and a kind of mentor. He's like my sort of godfather, weirdly, in the music industry. And he's like that with lots of people. And he calls me up on personal stuff and, and just is super supportive and kind. And um, initially, when I told him I was writing some songs and I didn't think they were band songs, he was like, whatever you do, don't do anything outside of the band. It's too precious a thing. And then I played him the first three songs and he said, I've completely changed my mind. This okay. has to be a solo thing. Um, and has ever since then been super supportive um, about the record. So. That's awesome. Yeah, he's he's very generous. Tell him hello for me. Oh, well. If you will. Oh, well. The next time you see him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Well, you know what? Um, yeah, thank you for coming by. Thank the you current. for having me. You guys have been so kind to us over the years. I'm well, really grateful. It helps that you make great music. Thank you. We're not as kind, maybe, if it wasn't as great. <laughs> so. Right, I get it. <laughs> um, no, but really, it's been um, it's been really fun to kind of just be witness to um, just again from 2007, 2008, whenever it was, to to where you have gone and and where you're going to continue to go. Mm-hmm. So best of luck. Okay. See you next time.